Hi everybody. I uh, hope you're all well. There we go. It's just kicked into life. Fantastic. Uh, I am back once again for the Renegade Master <laughs> and so on. Uh, tonight, I've, I've just got out of the shower. Apologies for the wet hair. And yes, uh, tonight we're going to be doing uh, the final few tweaks and user feedback on user feedback client feedback on the most recent uh, mixes from Mischfeld, uh, some of which I kind of behind the scenes I've been playing with some new plugins this week so I've accidentally fixed half of the things that they said because I it turns out upon reflection with a bit of distance I heard the same things. So we're also going to be playing with a few new plugins that I got over Black Friday. I hope you got what you wanted over Black Friday. Uh, shouldn't be clipping, no? No clipping here. And um, yeah, if there's any clipping, it must be on your end because my levels are automatically compressed inside the microphone. Uh, let's have a look. Make sure there are no filters on going crazy. Ah. Yeah, I'm definitely not. Hello. Anyway, um, yeah, everything looks good level-wise. No clips anywhere. And yes, uh... Mmm. Bonsoir, Marty. Okay. I've been playing with a few things that have revealed things in the mix to me. Uh, oh, I'm a bit loud. Okay, a bit loud I can work with. Uh, let me have a look at Vox Former. Uh, I've not changed anything. There we go. Let's go with let's go with that. Let's see how that does for us. There we go. Lovely. Yes. Now, um, let's flick over to our screen cap. There we go. Hopefully that should still be good for you. And this is the new plugin that I've been playing with. I've also been playing with this. This is... Uh, this is the uh, Slate Audio VSX uh, with version 1.1. And what it has updated is they've got new positions, like the Howie Weinberg room now has an engineer position, which actually sounds good. You're not going to hear that. How can it be less boomy in the lows? They didn't touch anything apart from volume. Weird. Uh, anyway. Um, yeah. I'm drinking something a little different today. This is... A cocktail of mine that's traditionally called the Japanese Slipper, but I've renamed it the Green Jelly Baby. Uh, this is Lime Cordial, Midori, and Grand Marnier. It's supposed to be Cointreau, but Grand Marnier's got a little bit more of a kick. It tastes like a Green Jelly Baby. Ah, strong and good. But yeah, this means this is actually even more accurate to the point where I've turned off the high frequency lift I was using before. Now, this is the one that will make the most difference to you. Uh, this is flatlined by Submission Audio. And this is a final limiter that is so ridiculously transparent sounding compared to anything else I've had up to the recent times that it made me rethink a lot of... Uh, made me rethink a lot of my mix choices to the point where I made... I got Microsoft sticky notes and made myself a list of things because these are all the things that I did to these mixes uh, which I will go ahead to the, the the older set of songs that we mixed and make these changes. This is what I do when I'm working across several projects that are for the same album, which sometimes happens, is I make a set of specific, we are going to change exactly this and nothing more. And that way I can be dispassionate about changing all the settings in the other projects and it should work out the same. And if it doesn't, then we dive in rather than getting lost in a rabbit hole of, oh, a snare EQ. So yeah, I think I'm going to buy Flatline. This is just the seven day demo. Although, of course, if I can get hold of Ermin or Andrew, the creators, and uh, maybe do a video for them, then that could work. But I'm so insanely busy at the moment that I don't really have time to do a video. I might just might just buy it. 
Um, <clears throat> but yes, the first thing that I got was Oxford Inflator, which was a massive disappointment to me because I turned everything up to make things sound louder, turned the output down to match, and when I turned it on and off, it didn't do anything that I liked. Maybe it did in better in, in like times gone by. But, but yeah, with the output turned down, I couldn't hear a damn thing in difference. So that just went. Uh, I turned off Brainworks Master Desk uh, and put the flatline plug in because I've been tweaking the, the sound in flat in, in uh, Master Desk. And anyway, I'm rambling. Have a quick listen to this. This is the start of uh, Voic Bin now. Uh, there are a couple of other things on here. There's Track Spacer. Uh, track spacer 2.5 I have on the bass being chained from the kick and I have on the rhythm guitars chained from the vocal. So these should and do, because I'm using them very subtly, just make a little bit more room in the mix without that fight. What was the other th new thing that I got? Because there was one new thing. Oh, Fresh Air. The new Fresh Air plugin from Slate. Uh which replaced the Noveltech vocal enhancer that I was using and sounds so much nicer. So here we go, let's have a listen to this. There we go. Yeah. So the thing, the first thing that I just learned there is I, I had been playing around with the overheads and they didn't quite lift themselves. So on the group for the room mics and everything, I put a little bit of fresh air and suddenly the hi-hat was piercing. And that was some feedback I had before from the, the band, but the rest of the overheads weren't clear at all. So what I just decided to do then was just change the overhead, change the hi-hats for something uh, much darker. Now for anyone going, oh, these fancy modern plugins, we didn't have that in my day, that kind of thing. Fresh Air is actually a really nicely wrapped up version of uh, Dolby A noise reduction which was something used in the 70s and 80s and something that actually has been used for a very long time. What was supposed to happen originally to get much less noise on tape in the 70s and 80s is the Dolby A noise reduction took your source sound and kind of crushed it down, all the high end, all the low end, kind of folded it in before it went on tape. And then when you played it back through a Dolby A system, it kind of undid that and brought all the high end and the low end back engineers found that if you had a source that didn't have Dolby A on it and you used the decoder, it dynamically lifted all the high end and made it sound really crisp, but not like an EQ because it's volume based, it's dynamic based. Um, it's much less harsh. So if you've got a ding, 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 ding on a, a hi-hat, for instance, only the hard hit ones are going to shine. And same with the vocal, the uh, the more aggressive bits have a, a kind of a, an air and a gloss on them, but you don't just constantly get a over the top uh, where you would just do if you cranked a high EQ. 
Uh, and so for years and years, uh, it's been a kind of a secret weapon of engineers that they've uh, had the old Dolby A converters that they don't really use anymore, uh, but using just the the decoder and then blending it in uh, bit by bit. And I've talk- I'm sure I've talked about this on a mixed stream before, um, saying, I wish that I had that. And here it is. Now, the one that really fascinates me Oh, good God, my dad's bought a VGA base. Oh, sorry. Um, the John Lennon mod? So you'll have to tell me what the John Lennon mod is. Uh, but I'm pretty sure this was something that wasn't really in use widely as a trick until after John Lennon's death. So, <clears throat> I don't think so. Um... Yeah, the, the other thing, the main thing that I've been using here, yeah, Track Spacer. So Track Spacer, I'll just play the bass here with Track Spacer. This is uh, side-chained uh, to the kick drum. So every time the kick drum plays, the I, I have this limited, so only things below 800 hertz are affected. So all the top end, all the grind, all the definition on the bass doesn't duck at all. But when the kick goes, let's hit play. You see there? Yeah, so there we go. There's a specific <clears throat> frequency that the, the kick is at, and only that specific frequency is being ducked. And I've got the amount very, very low. I'm using this less than 10%. I don't need it to be like a French house track going boah, boah, boah. But between that and the kick, it's like doing that with ducking compression, but far cleaner because the top end doesn't duck. Yeah, it's nice. Actually, I think I changed things in here to be a bit more aggressive. I'll have to compare and contrast this with the other project. So I've got Three, three, minus, and three. And on the kick on the other project, it's three. Ah, yes, I did. Uh, I brought up, what did I bring up? 4.8K by 2.8 dB. Uh, so I'm just going to type that in. Kick, SSL, uh, 2.8 dB, 4.8K. And I will come back to that later. So now that's written down. Yeah, so the frequencies don't double up. It's very clever. And so the the big one for me on this on all the Mischfeld stuff is the guitars, the rhythm guitars. Uh where are you? Rhythm guitars. I'll just play them on their own. So the rhythm guitars have track spacer on as well. Uh, chained to the vocals, but it's not being affected below 100 hertz. It's not being affected above 5k. So any of the chug chug and any of the top end on the guitar doesn't get moved ever. So you don't notice it. If I hit play. There we go. It's very subtle because I've got the percentage at 12.5%. So if I went to 100%, you'd really hear this. I'll play that now. And that sounds really strange. And if I play the mix back with that, you'll hear the guitars will just disappear when the vocals come in. It's weird, but watch. <laughs> Did you hear that little bit of guitar in there? Because that was the only chance it had. Whereas if I just bring that back to, yeah, 12.5%. Uh, one of the things I noticed is the vocals were too loud by a little bit because I was trying to compete with the guitars. So, but because of the way the guitars go arrangement wise, if I just take out a specific EQ section, the guitars sound kind of lost and hollow and it's a constant battle of trying to find the balance between the two so i got as close as i could and then track spacer uh let's play that little bit of the chorus here without track spacer and you'll hear that the vocals in the chorus fight
And again with... And because of that, if I remember rightly, I was able to turn up the rhythm guitars. I'll just have to check that. Uh, BX console, 4.2 minus 6. So these are all the kind of things I'm having to go through now and check. Minus 6, 4.2. All right, so I didn't change anything level-wise on the guitars, and that's cool. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, YouTube won't let you just paste stuff in other people's uh, chats. Kind of a safety thing. But yeah, now I have a list of revisions that I need to go through from the band uh, on songs five to seven. Now let's have a look. Uh, Moen on Stalingrad. Uh, please use a clean sound for the first solo. Okay, so how many seconds in is that? Right here? No, I'm not, I'm not going to do that because I tried that as a very, very clean tone and it sounded it sounded weak. It, it didn't sound good at all, especially the um, these bits. So the um, the brrr never sounds good super clean. Uh, and it's distinctly lower gain than every other thing that we have on here. Yeah. Oh, um. <laughs> uh, I'm being texted by Jack Gardner. <laughs> there we go. Ah, uh, yes. Hopefully, yeah, I'm going to get everything for this. Well, let, let's try something. Let's just mute that. Uh, da -da, da -da -da, and I'll put this here. Try something a bit clever. This could be one of those rare times where the DI is right. Yeah, Jack, Jack Gardner. Uh, so yeah, the question that Marty has in chat. Uh, for now, I'm going to say no comment just because I've not talked to him yet. Uh, he's not been well last few days. He's had food poisoning. Apparently he's okay now, but I would talk to him now, but... Here we are. So yes, um, just in case and nothing's confirmed, I will. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'll just say maybe for now. I will just uh, use an EQ on this. Uh, just to take out a specific low mid frequency.
liked that one. And yeah, what uh, what our, our guy was saying in chat earlier before about the John Lennon mod, if it turns out that uh, Mr. Lennon was the first person to do that trick, I'm all ears. I'd love to know about it because that would explain why it wasn't a thing until the 80s. If maybe they were doing it on the double fantasy record, which I'm not particularly familiar with. Which, if I remember rightly, was the one he was just finishing as he was shot. So... Uh, to um, uh, two minutes forty, so I have to work out from here. We're at fifteen thirty, so I need seventeen, eighteen, ten. Here, oh, the f yeah, there. I know what he means. Really bring out that ba -da -da -ba. I got you. Ah. Sorry, I'm accidentally flicking around with this mouse. It's a little disorienting. Right, they would like to hear more of the wah on that section, which is also fine. Uh, I think the wah one is this one. Okay, so they'd rather have the ending uh, than the pick scrape. Okay, that's also fine. Well, we can still have a pick scrape because there were two of them. I'll just push the sound up on this one. There we go. That's fine. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Oh, hello, Michael. Oh, oral surgery. Oh, dude. Mm. Gerald. Yep, awesome. Right. Uh, so they um. What I want to do at this point was they they would like to hear more of the wah solo. So, what I need to do is just turn down. <laughs> The non-war solo. 
and turn up the wah solo. All fine. Uh, da, da. Just automation this, automation that. Oh. No, I wanted to automate on the overall group, not on the singular guitar. Oops. All right, so while well, guitar's done, uh, get the original note out. Is it possible to give the last rhythm rick section after the guitar solo another kick? Uh, not really. Um, because that's an arrangement thing, guys. You, you've dropped out a load of instruments and you're asking me to give you more. Um, mm, doesn't really work like that. We'll give it a tiny bump, but beyond that we start to lose the drums and then we try and push the drums and we start to crush the master bus and we start to get a cascade of... of problems. All right, and the other thing is the drummer played a few machine gun snare rolls on that song. They're a bit too quiet. Uh, uh, that may have sorted itself out now with the uh, the overall change on the drums and the uh, the limiter being much clearer. Also, you've got a snare hit in the middle of each one that's tickled. <clears throat> yeah, this is what's happened. This is he's programmed all the the, the snare hits to be so inhumanly hard that when it comes to fills there's nowhere to go so a note for everybody when you're drum programming don't use 127 velocity unless you really 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 mean it because each hit on its own sounds great when it's full hit but think about context you've got nowhere to go if, if your normal rhythm is a drummer trying to desperately to hit as hard as they ever have to the point where they might actually break the skin every time they hit it yeah that that means that there's no room for humans because the human part then drops out whenever you fill that that's not how humans do and that's one thing when i do human yeah you hear that those three notes there are just lost because the six notes around it are absolutely superhuman. Maybe the last one could be superhuman.
we go. The other thing that I changed as part of the mix, which I don't think I've mentioned yet, which is worth talking about here, is I changed a lot on the drum kit in terms of things like the way the transient trans X by waves. I had the duration of the attack a bit a bit short, so it was kind of popcorning a little bit, whereas now it's got that real smack to it. So let's try this. Let's see. Sounds good. So let's move on to the Reaper. As a hiss. on them the hiss is coming from the DI tracks because amps don't hiss like that on their own Using uh, a DI box with a gain structure like this into any kind of domestic interface, you are going to get noise because look at the size of that track when you've got all of this to record with. That's 14 dB, 18 dB. twenty two dB of headroom there, which means that that's how much potential noise is introduced when I have to then run that back through an amp. So, yeah, something to keep in mind for next time. Has this ever actually used, this EQ? Because if this isn't used, what I could do is use this and then just...
then I can automate it to be bypassed most of the time. Uh, where is the re -EQ bypass there? So if I click bypass there, bypass there, so it's off all the time except for start of the song. There we go. And low poo ninja. Yep, so there we go. Um Tom's not supposed to be loud and aggressive. Okay. That's how the uh, Tom sound on this track. He asked me to put the dynamics on them. Right, that's my answer here. Is to uh, have the overheads and rooms and everything way further down. There we go. gonna leave the boosting on the bass because uh, I think with with all the changes I've made it shouldn't need it and especially when I come to the master the low end will just be lifted so that is, is a general thing not so much of a problem okay okay people send me also why do I get sent loads and loads of stuff just as I go live always the way uh Vocals in the group. What was that here? Looks like if I must, we all go down, 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 just not together. Your suits and ties may be my leather. Us, we all go down, down. Down, down, just not together. Down, down, just not. Yeah, this is where it kind of. Down, just not together. Yeah, I I listened to the the rough mix, and in the rough mix, these had all been edited to be in time, but then for some reason, I got sent vocals that were not in time. And what I get sent is generally what I work with because I have to assume that you've made an artistic decision there. Save, save, save. Go. Go down, 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 just not together. Your suits and ties may be my leather. May be my leather. But Grim or Reaper may be my leather. S button I want, not D. Ain't beat my leather. Ain't beat my leather. 
Reaper, Grim or Reaper! Who's the slow one? You. But Grim or Reaper! He knows no difference! We'll serve the world! But Grim or Reaper! He knows no difference! We'll serve the world! Happy indifference! Happy indifference! Yeah, nudge, 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 yeah. Burns. Burns. What you achieve will be buried in oblivion. Whether you're a smith or clerk, we all go down, 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 just not to descend on these stories. No flowers or lash. They really want this lone R in? Okay. Glories, alone in the box. And welcome the Reaper! We put no glories, alone in the box, filled with acid and agony, blackness and pain, a sorrow and captivity, and just when you think, oh lord, I cannot see deeper, we stand as Marais, and welcome the Reaper! We all go down, just not together! It's not five minutes in. Oh, uh, that'll be the happy indifference bit. That was a weird bug, actually. Yeah, that one I know because something weird happened with Melodyne that nudged them all out of time. That's that's fine. Now, last song. Uh, uh, there's a backing vocal in the verses that'd like to be slightly louder. Cool. All right, uh, cut off a couple of seconds at the end. Oh yeah, that's a mastering thing. That's not that's not worth worrying about. That's the kind of thing you do. Really, at the end, two twenty five. Half oh, uh, two twenty five. Oh, lead guitar slightly quieter. Okay. <laughs> More of that, okay, cool. Save. Snare drum fills are a bit weird again, apparently, which is fine. Uh, view, piano roll notes, diamonds, drum mode, there we go. So yeah, I'm gonna take every snare hit down by a tiny, tiny amount, and then any snare rolls. Yeah, there's a reason why in mixes, single hits of snares sound much bigger than rolls. It's because compressors work in a certain way where if you're still making the noise, it's not going to come back quick enough. Plus, a lot of the sound from my drums come from 
that. Ivy, go to sleep. <laughs> Let's have a look at the effects on the snare, just see if there's anything there that I can just crush. It has got a compressor on this now. Let's see what happens if I really make the release fast. How's that compared to before? way louder. Right, well that's the tweaks done on these tracks. Now then, now to make this interesting and try and copy all of this over to, in fact, no, first thing we're gonna do, save, exp and I'm gonna turn off Flatline and export these. Uh, because the next step is the mastering. So I'm going to, uh, let's call this mix five wave file, 24 bit, 44 K. Uh, no, we're going to mastering. Let's make it 32 bit floating point just because uh, it makes some sticklers happy. Uh, three regions, mix five, go. And yes, yeah, some of the things I did on the master bus, uh, processing where I took the volume way down because uh, each successive plugin was uh, it's juddering a little bit because of course it is because I'm rendering don't worry about that too much Just me. that's the main thing uh, we'll come back to not juddery in a few minutes any questions now to It's also using every possible core of this the computer, I think, to panickingly uh, get through everything. Yep, 
Yeah, no, 32-bit floating point is the complete opposite. It cannot benefit your ROM recording because there's only 120-something bits of uh, dynamic range that 24-bit perfectly covers. 32-bit floating point is only a benefit while mixing uh, because it means that when you have different levels on d different tracks, when you're running up into the hundreds of tracks, uh, then you've got uh, a much better uh, measure between tracks when you do the maths to add them up and you don't end up with rounding errors. Rounding errors to what end up with a slightly weird uh, out to mastering is that there is no integer rounding in between the two. You don't have to do it. I usually don't, but I thought, you know what, why not? Mm -hmm. Yes, hello, Ace Man. Oh, big stretch. It's been a hell of a couple of days. Oh, no, we appear to have clipped on a track. What the shall we do? That's fine. <laughs> yes, it might be rendering. You are absolutely right, Ace Man. We are rendering out three of our very, um, very complicated mixes. Uh, if you missed the first hour of the stream, we've now started using uh, Flatline by Submission, which I turned off before we sent this to the mastering project. Um, started using Tracked Beta uh, on the bass to make the and on the rhythm guitar to make room for the vocals. And what else? Uh, started using uh, Slate's Fresh Air on the drums and on well, on the overhead specifically and on the vocals uh, instead of that Novel Tech vocal enhancer, which I never quite liked the sound of, but I kind of thought it was good. Uh, no, uh, uh, AD converted are 3.4 bit it's just that anything outside of the dynamic range of what they can capture is just recorded as noise uh, so yeah you just get a noise for below what you can capture but the thing is there is no such thing as the bottom with analog digital conversion 0 dB is just a measurement of maximum loudness that a converter can capture an analog to digital converter can capture anything going down from that, going infinitesimally small. Uh, the question is how far can it go before it just um, gets the signal buried in its own noise? Yeah, so yeah, so for Andre, if you've just tuned in, yes, um, I am rendering on the same computer. And that is what's happening here. It's... It's going to clear itself up in a minute. Uh, it's to be expected. Perfectly normal behaviour. But yeah, it, it's funny how many people strongly believe in things that they heard off the internet once, uh, but they don't actually have any good reasoning behind it. So, yes... Yeah, the why is always important to me. Because um, when you, when someone on, like, say, the Gear Sluts forum says, oh, well, this is because, uh, you know, I believe in this, and then start waffling, so, but why? And then they always get really annoying. Go, I've been doing this 30 years, I should know. No, you can do the same thing badly for 30 years, or 40 years, or 50 years. And that doesn't make it right. I'm always happy to learn new things, change grow, find improvements wherever I can, and understanding is at the core of improving the positivity. Oh dear. Got a client tape, uh, one track with guitar and two vocal tracks with bleed everywhere. Oh, good stuff. Yeah, 
There we go. And as you can see, everything's gone straight back to normal now. I've done the uh, thing. So I'm going to open my effects on here and just copy the master bus because it's easier. Because uh, I know there's nothing automated on my tracks to two to four because I've got seven tracks that I'm going to be doing the... Uh, there we go. So that's my new settings. The Shadow Hills Class A doesn't add any gain at the end. The Better Maker EQ actually reduces it by 3 point something dB. Flatline boosts the whole thing by 6 dB, which is great, except that... Turn it off. What are you supposed to do with that mess? Just, just EQ balance it and do what you can. If they don't like it, tell them you did the best you could with what, you, what they gave you. Yeah, it's the problem with some recordings, you know. Uh, so let's keep having a look. So my drum group should be up by 2 dB. But what's different? Uh, so this is the old, this is the new. In fact, this is another thing that I know doesn't, uh, doesn't have any automation on. So I'm just going to copy all this. And... Just delete all these and paste the new ones in. Uh, sn oh yeah, so my kick is supposed to go up by 3 dB at 4.8k. Now I'm getting my list up. So 2.8k yeah, 2 at 4k. 2.8k at 4 8k yeah 2.8 4.8 okay snare down to 9.6 i mean these these faders are still way too loud but i've kind of made my own bed there uh and the trans x those settings seem quite different trans x yeah i'm just gonna copy this effect and do no, I didn't. Uh, um, I got my finger on space instead of alt and paste effect there. Um, any difference on snare? Oh, I've actually used the Rev G snare on the uh, Rev G compressor on the snare there. Interesting. They look similar. Uh, toms won't be any different, hi hats won't be any different. Oh, close you down. So I'm going to copy all this lot off the far microphone. And oh, what's the volume difference? There isn't one. So I'm pasting fresh air in here now, including a uh, yeah, big dip there on the EQ. Uh, finish trip. Not doing much. This is all good, I think. Uh, let's just change everything that's on the overheads because I don't think I changed the room mics. Although I did take the overheads down from 1.8. Yeah, there we go. So now we're getting to the core of the changes. And uh, that's all done. I need to send the kick to the bass, but to audio three and four. And then I need to copy track space uh, over beyond L2. Uh, I need to send the lead vocal group out to the rhythm group on tracks three and four. And I need uh, the rhythm tracks, track spacer. In fact, I'm just going to copy all the stuff off there just in case I've changed anything. Don't think I have, but you never know. Um, I wrote everything down, but I was being impulsive while I was checking things out and it turned out well. So rather than just revert, I kind of saved it. There we go. 
Yeah, no, it's funny. Ben says, yeah, spent a couple of decades doing a lot wrong. If I listen to mixes that I did over 10 years ago now, I listen back and I go, ooh, kid, what were you doing? Kid, stop. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to, just for the sake of it, copy and paste the SSL channels on these guitars. I think they're the same. But I'm um, just in case. Close. There we go. Just in case, gonna delete the old ones and copy paste new ones. So these should be both. Oh, so now my guitar should be. No, the levels I'm gonna leave where they are because I've been automating guitar levels. Pretty. Sh oh yeah, and so the uh, the novel tech can go. Uh, lead vocal. Should be at minus 0.94 now with fresh air on the end. Let's see how this all sounds. Uh, okay, so the vocal group. Oh, that's right. Uh, so the vocal group, if we're looking mix rack, I've got this over here, which should be at minus six point something. Let's look at my sticky note. So rhythm guitar, I've copied the track spacer, same there. Uh, Fresh air instead of an novel tech trimmer to minus seven. I think it was minus six point eight three. So I called it. Yeah, there we go. Uh, snare down, overheads up in SSL. I copied and pasted the SSL. I think. Uh, so yeah, I copied and pasted the entire signal chain. Yeah, that output is now turned up, and. Uh, Okay. Right, let's see how these three songs now sound. See if anything sounds wrong after these adjustments. I'm just going to oh, take Snap off. I'm already hearing something that I should have done earlier, which is clean this gap up. They all go did air. They should go. listen to this with flatline turned on so it is going to be louder fair warning might want to grab your volume
That's something I was wondering about before, is that because there's a kind of a softer snare hit on these flams first, uh, it's crushing the, the overhead compressor before the second, the hard hit snare has a chance to go bat on your ears. Uh, so, making it louder. Yeah, so Pazman, you should talk to Ace Man because um, Restream is apparently something you can actually use over the internet, although I've only ever done it locally. Uh, but you can get wave quality audio sent over a network. If you can get that to work, good luck. <laughs> but it can work. Um, there's uh, audio movers do something, which I'm going to... Uh, audio movers. Audiomovers.com. Uh, yeah, there's there's a thing. It's a paid service, audio movers, but it it's like live streaming, uh, low latency, wave quality. Um, it's yeah, but yeah, that's that's the paid option. And then there's OBS Ninja, which I've not actually used yet, but um, the thing I watch every year, um, yeah, just the website for that is OBS Ninja. You might be able to send. Uh, yeah, remote screen shares and sound and stuff in a very high quality using OBS because it's, uh, yeah, it's very clever. Although I've not used it in that capacity. Uh, yeah, it's a thing. Let's listen to this song, Berate, and see if anything sounds weird.
That's the other thing I've not done is switch out the hi hat. Because uh, these black label Sound Edge hi hats have something in them that just hurts. Whereas these slightly darker custom dark hats don't have that. Lovely. They'll do nicely. Konzentriert, heute kratzt uns gar nichts mehr. Ey, zieht euch aus und kommt mal her. Gleich ist ja auch schon Mitternacht. Wir haben uns für euch schick gemacht. Ey, jetzt ist Schluss mit Tresen stehen. Jetzt ist Zeit, um euch zu drehen. Leute, seid ihr bereit? Für drei Minuten Zärtlichkeit. This is all sounding good to me. Suddenly went all jazz fusion on me. I'm glad I, glad I didn't listen to that. Yeah, something's a bit strange here. I do remember them uh, sending me uh, updated drums, uh, which I don't remember if I actually dropped them in. So this is a really good time to do that. Uh, all right. Uh, let's make, yeah, make sure Snap is on. Uh, hello? Uh, adjust media to project tempo, yeah. Because we don't need anything past there. I did just put some effort into uh, fixing all of that stuff, so I'm just going to cut it, put that in, and see if that fixes it. Why is it that whenever I humanize things, it moves other things? That's got to go. But yeah, it, it seems that whenever I humanize things, it messes with the MIDI.
Yeah, that needs cleaning up. S for split. Select. Drag you back to hell. Bumf, that can go. Okay, save, next, um, and just check the ending. Cool, and we'll check good command. Yes, uh, oh, that snare's really quiet, and probably that one too, both should be way louder. Uh, yeah, Ace Man, if you've not heard of Flatline, that's probably because it only came out this week. Um, it's from Submission Audio. Uh, uh, Ermin Hamidovich, uh, the guy who did the mastering on the last Periphery album, all the Pliny stuff, uh, he's the, like that guy. He also made Gin Bass and Euro Bass, so... Yeah, metal, metal is their thing. But this uh, limiter apparently uh, does what, like, basically Lavery Gold converters do. And uh, rather than trying to do the kind of clever, super transparent thing, they actually just gracefully clip like, yeah, like Lavery Gold's do, that kind of thing. Und ich glaube, ihr habt's auch erkannt. 
Und ich reiß trotzdem jetzt den Kopf hoch Ich habe einen Plan Ich such mir ein Ziel am Horizont Und das greife ich jetzt an Hey, hallo! Sounds good to me. Okay, Willow Lacrosse. The lead vocal needs some distorted, saturated doubling in parallel. You must be new here. Um, hello, welcome to the stream. We don't do backseat mixing here. Um, I make the, uh, the the choices based on my experience and what I would like to hear. Um, if you want to ask questions, feel free to ask questions. If you would ask why I'm not doing something, that's also perfectly fine. Uh, but yeah, I'm not mixing. This isn't a Twitch play type stream. You're not instructing me in how to mix. This is my style and I'm showing you and taking you along for the journey. Yeah, so Flatline isn't cheap, um, but I've compared it uh, over the last few days to Ozone 9's best limiter to Brainworks Master Desk and to the old site of GX and it just kills them all because it sounds crispy and clear and doesn't squash anything. Uh, you can, it, it is not an all-in-one mastering tool. This thing does one thing and one thing only, which I kind of like because it, it's very clear about what it is. No pretensions. Now, uh, that was all great, so I'm going to turn Flatline back off, which means the level will drop by 6 dB, and I'm going to render all of these. I'm going to call it Mix 5, just to keep them all in parity uh, with the other three songs that we did earlier. And, yeah, there we go. Use it on every project. Uh, click, 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 click three regions that's gonna make me three files everything is gonna go stuttery again that is to be expected don't worry that's just my computer having a panic there we go um in the meantime yeah um i was saying yeah the fresh air from slate i really like it i i mentioned earlier in the stream it's it's a basically a dolby um dolby a noise reduction unit used incorrectly and it provides especially in parallel a really nice little bit of saturation and a bit of a thing um yeah you just need a transparent limiter this is just about the most quote-unquote transparent limiter that i've heard like it it does chop the tops off in a way that things like yeah lavery gold uh converters do uh where it just sounds graceful and I'm using it for about 6 dBs of reduction to just take the tops off those snares more than anything so that they still sound like they're 6 dBs louder than everything else, but they don't actually make everything peak to hell. Uh, so yeah, this, this seems to be not quite jamming the computer up as much on this mix. This is good. So yeah, uh, when this is done, I've got one more song... Uh, which is Punk Rock Him Summer, the first song we did. I have to go back to that now and update all the sounds on that to match what we've, where we've come on this long journey. And then we'll start talking about mastering and we'll only get so far with that uh, for two reasons. Firstly, uh, I got a text from the band earlier. There are at least one, maybe two more songs they want to add to this and make it basically an album at that point. And... 
the uh, other thing is that at that point, I'm going to be using references of other mastered songs that I very much like and hold up as standards to be compared to. And that will get me in a lot of copyright trouble. And depending on the songs that I use will either mean that you can never watch the video again, which isn't great for my channel, or I might get a copyright strike, which isn't the... Oh, sorry, I might get copyright notice, which isn't the worst, or I might get, yeah, copyright strike. Yes, nice camera quality. Well, thank you. Um, I'm using my, my B camera for this, which is a Lumix GX80 with a 25mm prime micro four-third Lumix lens, uh, which is currently set to f2. And I've got a couple of lights, which make all the difference. And I've got a few nice little LEDs behind me to make it all pop a little bit. I'm in my home studio. <laughs> Did I get my new Revamp and M1 Mac yet? Uh, so I've... <laughs> I've I've not ordered an M1 Mac. I won't. Uh, but I have ordered the Rev. Uh, and hopefully I'll be one of the first to receive one. But because of the way it's been and because I kind of got in the queue quite late on, I don't get particularly special treatment. I think I get to get one of the early proper retail ones, as it were. Lumix, it's what the the lens or the camera the camera is a gx80 the lens is the cheap f1.7 25 mil prime uh which looks great i mean it looks a lot better when you blow it up and use it in 4k but yeah generally for the bigger shoots i've got a gh5s and I've got a Metabone Speed Booster and a whole set of uh, Canon EF lenses for when I'm doing it properly. But this is my little home office. This is my home mix setup. Uh, so, yeah, I don't want to go all out for this. I've got a tiny little space behind the two screens here to, to put a camera. So, yeah. Why is Apple so popular in the music industry? Well, um, good question. And the honest answer is historical. Um, 20 years ago, uh, Macs were being used in studios with uh, like DigiDesign, uh, especially uh, making hardware only for Macs at that time. So it was either you got a Mac, which cost less than the Pro Tools system that you put in it uh, as the host for the Pro Tools rig, or you didn't use it. And so I think the, the myth then perpetuated that Mac is best because back then um, CPUs and native processing were nowhere near powerful enough to do any sort of uh, high powered high powered mixing and that kind of thing and the old HD cards for Pro Tools were way more powerful for the audio than the actual computer was so Pro Tools was essentially just a shell telling those cards what to do so yeah it's it's a, a hangover at this point that um because that was the way it's only in the last four or five years when the up until the very recent mac pro there have been no options that a lot of musicians who for 20 years have gone oh well i use apple because i've always used apple have uh, kind of awoken from the spell and more and more do so every day now I know Apple have got this M1 chip with the new ARM thing, and they are quite impressive, but for a professional, they are not nearly powerful enough yet. If they can make something way more powerful than that that doesn't cost sixteen to $20,000 for a unit, I might well consider changing. But right now, they ride on their reputation so much that their prices, there we go, finished rendering, are way above what they should be which is horrible. So yeah, I have nothing against Apple as a company. I mean, right now, I've got an iPhone. Uh, I use an iPad. I am I have been an Apple user for the last decade. But in terms of their laptops and desktops, they are not doing what they should do for people like me because of reasons that I could spend an hour talking about. And it's it's business decisions that don't work well for us, but a lot of us as the industry, we cling on blindly to what we already know, which isn't great. 
Switching to Windows for music. Yeah, I mean, the the other thing is that, uh, yeah, if you're going the Apollo route, that's the Thunderbolt route, which isn't the Apple route, it's the Intel route. Intel make Thunderbolt, not Apple, but Apple got in early and made a very strong licensing agreement with uh, with Intel. And that means that by default, Macs come with Thunderbolt, although it's going to be much more difficult in the future. Yeah. Here's a fun fact. Did you know the brand new Macs that came out with the M1 chips do not have Thunderbolt in them at all? Now, before anyone corrects me, think about this. They have two ports on them and they are USB 4 ports. They can they can backwards be they, they are backwards compatible with Thunderbolt. Uh, they they run Thunderbolt interfaces, but the old Thunderbolt licensing is being dropped now. The the new Macs they don't have Intel chipsets in them, so they can't call it Thunderbolt, and they don't have the license anymore. So how long now are Apple going to actively support Thunderbolt as a standard when they've just had a major fallout with Intel and aren't even using their chips anymore? So yes, um, fun fact. So stuff does still work for now. It's at, at the moment, it's just a weird curiosity that it's like, oh, they've changed the name. But in future, that might cause problems. So yeah, I'm going to save this and close this tab. I've still got the songs five to seven tab, which I'm going to hit save on. Yeah, one of the, one of the best things about Reaper, like I was saying last session, is the project tabs. Um, because the band have sent me three songs in a block each time recently, I actually have three songs in a project file and it is easier on the brain, but it means that with project tabs, uh, let's just see my massive list, Punk Rock in Summer memory test, probably. Yeah. There we go. A UAD card being a doorstop. Oh, I could go on for ages about how I will not use uh, UAD's ecosystem, but I won't. Yeah, uh, come on. Well, the thing is, Thunderbolt connectivity could go one of two ways. Um, it could become, it's just loading up all the Melodyne and stuff. Um, it could become the new standard or it could be dropped like a hot rock. We don't yet know. Um, I hope it stays and becomes the standard on everything now that Intel don't have an iron grip on the Apple license anymore and now have to get a little bit more desperate and kind of give it up, especially now that the technology that was Thunderbolt is being rolled into the USB 4 standard. Uh, oh, right. I don't have Neoverb. Um uh do, 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 do. uh well let's turn these all on and see how this sounds. See that's that's why is that down there? That's weird. Yeah, the thing about the UAD stuff, and I won't dwell on it too much, um, it does sound really good. Back in the day, I never thought it sounded any better than the native stuff, but sorry, I'm having ear trouble there. Um, um, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, you really like Logic because it comes with a huge library, but Reaper doesn't. That's the thing about the price difference. Logic costs three times as much. You can buy audio libraries to use with Reaper with that difference in the money. If that's what you want. It's not what I need. It's not what some other person would need. It is what some people need. And that's okay. But, yeah. Anything like that, I, I don't like it. Like outboard more than plugins. That's perfectly fair. Um... It's got to the point for me where it's it's rare now the outboard actually sounds any better to me than the plugins because I've got used to properly gain staging plugins, getting good quality source material, and you know making sure that I'm using 
things that are replacing the hardware in the same manner and not just trying to use things as a magic fix. Because that's, that's the thing that a lot of people using plugins do is they'll slam level into things that emulate analog uh, analog hardware. Uh, then they'll just crank it and think it's a, a kind of a, a magic fix and then listen to it and go, why doesn't it sound as good as the hardware? It's because when you're in front of the hardware, you have some respect for it. You have a little bit of fear and trepidation. You don't just massively run plus 24 dB of, vol of analog level into a compressor in the real world because you think you might break it. Yes. Oh, the whole thing about minus 18 dB as, as a large point of contention, but it's a very good uh, rough guide to use. There we go. Warm Audio's Tone Beast and WA76. Mm, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, not a fan of the Warm Audio stuff. I know too many people who know what they're talking about who've compared warm audio uh, gear to other stuff you can get and it's not come out favourably. So yeah, there we go. Let's just make sure this all goes across. Because a lot of the uh, the settings that have ended up Oh, nope, 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 nope. So is that, yeah, drum groups, plugins. I'll make sure I'm going this way with them, not the other way. So yeah, that true iron's got a lot of uh, level cut there, which is why I can push that up. Any good free auto-tune plugins? Uh, no. Sorry, you're out of luck there. You'll have to pay some money. That's what you really, really want. Um, although the or the actual Antares Auto Tune like Essential Basics is fine for most people, the sound isn't any different to their like Pro versions. If you're not going to use the their um crazy extra advanced stuff, which I don't. Uh, yeah. If I'm going to do advanced stuff, I use Melodyne. Because uh, it's good for that. Let's move these up. Uh, let's look at these. So, what have I changed? Changed the everything. Yeah. All right. Uh, it's John Brown from Monument sending me messages again. <laughs> what are you wearing? No, that's not what he's sending me. Uh. What I might have to do, yeah, what I will do here is I will just go a little bit crazy and just copy. Let's let's look at Punk Rock in Summer. Is there any automation in this track? Not really. There's a little bit down there, which means that's great because it, it means that I can copy the drums and bass from here uh, including all the automation just paste them in uh, which is going to take a minute I now have three full versions of uh, Superior Drummer 3 running which is going to cause a lot of concern to the computer or with 32 gigabytes of RAM. That's why I have that much memory because I like to do crazy things like this. Just hide the mixer for a minute. So there we go. There's all the CAC I don't need. So that's 6.7, 6.7, 13.4. That's the original 13.4. And 6.7. I'm going to move these up. <laughs> Just ask your vocalist to do a pitch perfect take. I mean, honestly, if you can, 
do. The best vocal part performances just just don't need any kind of pitch correction at all. And that's that's my favorite kind of pitch correction is is no pitch correction. So you know, right, let's just delete all of that. Oh, if you start digging around in the industry, you'll find concern over Walm Audio stuff. It's, it's, uh, when you start to open it up and actually have a listen critically, it's, mm, no. Actually, to be fair, the Tone Beast, I've, I've not heard anything bad about that, but the microphones, they're, they're not known for the microphones. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm not going to say any more about it because my experience of warm audio is limited, but I know people who have things to say. So that's, uh, yeah. That's all I have to say about that. Rhythm group, paste that on there uh, and send lead vocal group over to rhythm group over here somewhere. Make sure that's on three and four. And make sure that there's a send. Yep, yeah, there is a send on that. Okay. Let's look at my list again. So the, all the drum stuff is done. Lead vocals will need fresh air instead of the novel tech. So get rid of the novel tech and paste in. There we go. Oh, that's nice. Did I l learn Reaper from Kenny Joya? No, I did not. Um, I learned to use Reaper 10, 11 years ago. I don't think Kenny was doing anything then. So yeah, I've been using Reaper since, yeah, pre-Kenny. And, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the less I say about Kenny, the better. Okay. Stam Audio is a great alternative to Warm Audio. I know that, that uh, Josh Stam can take more than a little while to, to get things done because they've had, like, not only have we had the global situation this year, but uh, Chile, where their company is based, have had political uprisings and a whole new government and, like, Viva la Revolución type stuff. Uh, which hasn't helped them, and I definitely feel for them because that's less than great. Um, track spacer, track spacer. Vocals, right, so I do want to crank this by several dB and go into the mix rack there and affect it there so it's not pushing that group. It's quite so hard. Oh yeah, check out Stam Audio. Uh, they they're great. Uh, they're not just copying knockoffs of old hardware. They're they're pushing to make new stuff. Like they make an LA two A that also at the turn of a, an actual physical hardware click is now an LA three A, and then click it's now an LA four. They make an eleven seventy six that is a revision A, and click a button it's now a revision D. Click a button it's now a revision F, and it actually has all the components from all those revisions inside on the board, and uses relays to actually switch in and change the tonal character of the the hardware. <laughs> Genius. Like like I said, I'm mates with John Brown from Monuments, and I was in his studio at the weekend. Uh, we're in the same social bubble, so don't worry about 
that we we have been working together since 42 gear street in austria he's essentially my boss at this point in some ways so it, it, it's a thing and he's got a stam audio neve clone 36 uh, sorry 33609 and john actually has a neve 33609 and we compare them and honestly we prefer the stam to the neve Josh is building you a stam child. Jesus. I mean, good luck. Those things are so expensive and take so long. Wow. Greetings. Hello. Uh, hello, Mr. Bommel. Yeah. Uh, Ace Man might have started with Reaper 2. I started with Reaper 3. 3.1, I think it was. Uh, so I've been... That, that dates it. That definitely dates when I started using Reaper. When did Reaper 3 come out? August 2009. That's right. I read about Reaper 3 in Sound on Sound magazine in August of 2009. And it was such a glowing review that I made the leap and didn't look back. So, yeah. Three years, yeah. That 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 is the downside with the stuff. But from, um, yeah, yeah. John talked to to Josh Stam this week, and it seems like they're catching up, which is good. Because yeah, the the original Fairchilds were insane. I think it's what if if it's a six seventy, then it's got fourteen valves and like five transformers in it. They're insane. Anyway. Uh, that should take care of the vocal thing. Snare we sorted. Uh, rhythm guitar, bass. Right, let's see how this song sounds now. It might need some tweaks because there's different guitar tones on this and, you know, slightly different setup on everything. So it might be fine, it might not. Let's turn on flatline and hear it with some volume. Okay, that's kind of funny. So there are in Superior Drummer there are several layers of how open the hi-hat is down here. And one of them wasn't being used in any of the other songs and they wanted a tambourine, so I just patched it through to a tambourine. Uh which is why that sounded weird. Let's now just open it up a bit more and listen to that as it really should sound. Als Fetzer reingesprungen, dann 
die Kilometer, ich komm immer wieder her. Du siehst mich, so wie ich gerne wär. Scheiß auf den Kilometer, ich komm immer wieder her. Real automation for the lead vocal. Oh, okay, let's just try the vocal down a bit. Yeah, sounds good. I just turned the vocals down a touch. I think that they were just louder because of the automation points now than the other songs. Um, right, so people saying USB 3 and 2 and Thunderbolt. Um, I say this a lot, so I'll just give you the, the quick background. Uh, for audio, USB 2 and 3 are identical. Forget what it says about speeding gigabits because the way that USB works, it works in what's called packets. And so it kind of gets a chunk of information, waits until that chunk of information is full, or if no more data's coming, it, it kind of waits and then says, right, okay. And then it sends that chunk of data down the line. And for things like hard drives uh, or anything, like even things like uh, cameras, that's fine. Because the way it works is that it will like... Say you've got a 25 frame a second camera, you've got a 25th of a second, which in computing terms is a long time to get all that data together and then just sh shove it down, which is how USB hubs work, is that they all kind of take turns and, and let one send a packet, then another one send a packet. Um, I did use track spacer on the vocal. Uh, it's the first time I've used it this week and I'm using it very subtly, very subtly indeed. Um, but it's doing a thing and it does it. Oh no, I'm not using track spacer on the vocal. I'm using track spacer on the rhythm guitar keyed by the vocal. Um, yeah, you don't use track spacer on the track you want to make space for. You use track spacer on the tracks you want to get rid of. Anyway, yeah, back to USB and USB 2 and 3. In terms of audio, USB 3 has bigger packets, but it doesn't actually send them any faster. It sends just bigger chunks. Uh, whereas uh, Thunderbolt is useful for audio people, especially at the professional level, because it sends tiny little bits in a stream of data, which means that it doesn't wait, which means that latency is not the panic that it is with USB. Um, so yeah, um, there is still relevance for Thunderbolt, definitely, and what's now going to be USB 4. Uh, so um, yeah, it has its place, definitely. In my studio, I use an RME PCI Express card in the computer as the interface because it removes the USB bottleneck. We're not waiting. with things like, if you look at the latency here, I'm using an Audion Evo 8, which is a USB interface at home, which is great. Uh, it's got 10 millisecond delay in, 8 milliseconds out, 256 samples, which is quite a long time and can cause a lot of people issues. I've adjusted to it over a decade or more. Uh, and yeah, that's fine. But as I start to bring that down, you get pops and clicks because the audio interface can't handle it. And when it can't handle it, you get silence. And a momentary silence sounds like a pop or a click because it goes from sound to no sound, back to sound again. Uh, yeah, Thunderbolt is PCI Express wrapped up in a neat little bow and sent down a cable. PCI Express being the, where the card slots are in a PC. Uh, so there's no middleman. Uh, that's the idea anyway, which means, yeah, the latency is really removed as an issue. Uh, so you can get ridiculously low latencies on Thunderbolt without it being a massive burden on the system. Uh, yes. Uh, so yeah, RME PCI Express card, the, uh, the Radat. Is RME still the best type of latency? Yeah, I think so. But the cost is a lot. Um, 
so yeah, lots of lots of questions coming in right now. Uh, does that work with AMD? Yes, it does. Because the, the PCI Express card does not care what your, your computer is. It just works with the drivers. Uh, my studio computer right now is a Ryzen 9 3900 XT processor in that and that works flawlessly i run it down at 64 samples of latency uh which is what um on on pci express it's a two millisecond round trip which the human ear can't even perceive and it's amazing oh well yeah it's all right come on um yeah um yeah making the switch to rme is something i did Four years ago now, five years ago, there's a video on the channel about it. And it changed a lot for me because I could then reliably use things like software, compressors, EQs, whatever I wanted that didn't incur additional latency, which you have to watch out for, which is a software issue, not a hardware issue. Uh, and I could have things like um, reverbs and all sorts of stuff on things like a vocal for a singer who's very sensitive to timing and they were perfectly happy with it. So yeah, there you go. Yes. <laughs> Dante is also fast, but to get particularly um, low latency Dante, you need a specific uh, Dante PCI Express card for your computer, uh, which is a thousand pounds or a thousand dollars for that on top of everything else. You can use Dante without that though. You just incur a significant latency penalty. Uh, solid state logic native plugins don't rate them don't use them there's nothing that sounds particularly special about them to me yeah using dante in an all hardware solution is great there we go uh i'm using noctua fans on the pc i think i'm using one noctua fan in the pc and then nothing else it's almost entirely silent it's in a rack uh, and with an open top and almost entirely fanless and passive uh, so there's just no mixing no noise in there when i'm mixing which is great but yeah it's also intensely powerful uh, which is what we need so that i think i'm happy with i need to render this oh geez that was mix 12 so mix 13 i'm gonna turn off flatline i'm gonna make sure this is a wave file uh there we go 32 bit floating point and I will I will collate these into a mastering project and we will talk about mastering a little bit this is oh there we go make sure browse for file directory make sure it goes in the right place you can't stand the brown fans oh oh no oh no the color of the fans I will never look at in the machine that I use for work I don't care <laughs> I do not look at the insides of a computer unless something is wrong and don't get me wrong i've been building computers and loving doing that for 30 years now when i was a five-year-old i would get the screwdriver and accidentally make green sparks happen from the back of the floppy drive because the machine was still turned on uh, but yeah i've always loved uh, computers and building computers however <coughs> it's not the fun it used to be because it's all like lego these days uh so you know um it's fine it's just me um i keep up to date with hardware news but a lot of it isn't particularly relevant to us as audio guys and what is relevant in the last couple of months we can't even buy so uh, yeah, I'm kind of taking a back seat at the moment in terms of the PC videos and that kind of thing because there's not a lot I could tell you that would be useful. Uh, I did used to make uh, videos talking about building PCs specifically for audio and all I would get is people going, please build me a computer, which no, I don't have the time. You won't pay me enough extra to make it worth my time. If there are any problems, it'll come straight back to me, which I don't have the time for, etc., etc., etc. I'm not a PC shop. And the other thing is I just get loads of questions and loads of you're wrong because X. And it'd be like, actually, no, but I don't have the time to respond to all of these stupid comments. Yeah. 
brown fans are perfectly fine near my green PCB motherboard and my black PCB sound card. If you saw the inside of my computer, you might be horrified because with the RME card, with the added time code option, and at one point I also had a Blackmagic capture card in there, pretty much every one of my PCI Express slots was filled and there were ribbons everywhere. And yeah, it, it, it's not a pretty thing when you get into like pro audio. It's not like gaming where you can just go processor ram graphics nvme drive took away the wiring pretty no it looks like a dog's dinner um what you just ended up with two 3080s jeez i had a quick look this morning to see if i could order a 3060 ti uh, and they were out of stock immediately apparently it was 18 seconds they were out of stock in most places because the bots just went beep boop beep boop yeah. Are dedicated converters relevant? Only if your preamps are worth it. Only if your microphones live up to the preamps. Only if your mixing is up to the par where the converters will make the difference. Uh, especially output converters, only if the equipment you're going to be sending the sound back through is worth the difference. Uh, modern converters, generally, even the mid-range converters, are so good compared to what we used to have that they're absolutely fine unless you have the best gear in the world and the most critical ear, in which case, yes, at that point, that's the next weak link. Uh, how much did render speed improve compared to my previous computer? Uh, well, I'm actually mixing on my laptop right now because I'm at home. Uh, but when I'm in the studio, I went from a 6700K, so a quad-core Intel, to a Ryzen 3900X2, which is a 12-core. And everything literally renders three times as fast. It's got three times the number of cores. It, it, that's it. <laughs> it. It's... Because, especially on any mix that has more than 12 tracks with plugins on. That's the thing. The way that Reaper works specifically is that it multi-threads uh, the audio. If you've got two channels in a mix and they've got loads and loads of plugins on each, it doesn't matter how many cores you throw at it, it will not make it go any faster because the way that that will have to work is let's say you've got 10 plugins on a track. The processor has to go through one plugin, then the next, 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 then the next. Because that's how sound works. Inserts, it has to go through in order. There's no way to divide that workload because every time you would be waiting for the last plugin to give you its results. Uh, so uh, that's not going to work. But if you've got a, a dense mix like these with 30, 40, 50, this, oh, there we go. So this had the old drums in, but we actually got up to 72 tracks in this project, which is enough that spreading that over 12 cores instead of over four cores makes a significant difference because the workload can be split uh, in such a way that it's fairly efficient, fairly efficient to go, well, you've got all this processing to do, Mr. Drum Channel. You've got all this processing to do, Mr. Guitar Channel. Go away to the different cores and do it, and I will see you back here when you're done. That's how multiprocessing works. And yeah, with the modern processors, it's pretty good. Um, oh, dug out your old Apogee box from around 2000. Yes, they will sound decent because Apogee at the time were the absolute top of the tree. Thing is, like average converters now, not like hundred dollar USB interface, but like I don't know something like I don't know an Antelope Orion or something, something in the one thousand to two thousand dollar all in one interface region will have converters as good as that Apogee that you had which probably cost over a thousand dollars just for the conversion at the time but then apogee like i say were at the top of the tree then and that's why they still hold up now uh what would i suggest for a small home style studio as far as internal cards 
Would an external Alesis mixer hurt you for inputs? I wouldn't touch Alesis if they were on fire. Um, um, internal cards. I mean, what what is it you're aiming to do? Don't go to a card-based solution unless you already have preamps, converters, uh, analog to digital and digital to analog uh, because you're either going RME or you're not doing it with cards really um, that's that's the way of it is that there isn't, there isn't much of an option out there um, so my setup is fully modular the way that I see it um, I have Arturia converters and preamps I have Audient I have Focusrite I actually had Alesis at one point, but like I was saying, they got burned in a fire. Oops. <clears throat> um, but yeah. Looking to try your hand at recording a live band or drums. Well, in that case, get yourself a, a Behringer 1820 or whatever their equivalent is and a Behringer ADA 8200. You don't want or need a desk for that. Uh, this it, that that sounds like you need a lot of inputs. You don't need a great deal of outputs. You don't need faders. You don't need onboard EQ. You don't need a lot of what people used to use in the nineties and early two thousands. Uh, you would be wasting your money because when it comes to mix time, none of that will help you. Still got an Alesis microverb in one of the racks. Ugh. Uh, got Avantone mix cubes and Audio Technic M50X. Well, should you get CLA tens? No. I mean, the fact that you're asking this question means that the answer is no. The fact that you don't know 100% in your mind that that is the sound you know and that is the sound you have always mixed on and that is the sound that will get you the hits means it would be money down the drain. Um, because ns10s sound awful they sound disgusting they always have but a generation of mix engineers learnt how they worked and got used to it and in spite of them got great sounds not because of them um guys like bob clear mountain and chris lord algae they they didn't get good because they had the ns10s they just got good <laughs> And the fact that they did it on NS10s is completely coincidental. You'd be better off um, going with a system that gives you the most flat and neutral response that you can because mixing is a constantly moving target and things change. Yeah, instead of the CLA10s, get Sonarworks. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've been changing up the monitors in my room recently. I went from Adam A7Xs. I've, I've currently got the Adam Audio S2Vs in there. Uh, I'm hoping to get a set of monitors in there very soon uh, from a company. I'm not allowed to talk about them because they're not out yet. Um, I'll be trying some Amphions uh, this week. Uh, I'll be trying some KS Digital monitors this week uh, and I'll see how they go. Yeah, like the SM58, yeah. Do I use a hardware fader? No, I do not. Um, I've tried over the years. Um, I've had motorized faders. I've had a whole analog mixing desk. I stopped using them all because they're not accurate enough for me. And by the time that... Let, let's say that I need to automate this to be dipping here, jumping there. I go to the point, I make it bigger, I change my automation point from trim read to latch. I close this down, I press play, I find the time, I get my fader, I bump it. Is it perfect? Yes, great. Is it not perfect? No, go back and do it again. By, that t by the time I've done all of that, um, I could have just gone in, made it bigger and gone, I need exactly this section to be that much louder. 2 dB. Done. Thanks. Bye. That's what I learned 
over the years is that by the time I've set everything up, especially with the dense mix where you've got 50, 60, 70, 80 tracks, I'm flicking through banks on these things, trying to find the exact right track, trying to set the automation right, trying to get it all done. I could have just clicked a few buttons with the mouse and got that exact automation point that I wanted in a third of the time. So yeah, that's it. Faders have a certain thing. And especially if you're working in live sound, you want faders, but you'll have a desk where you can see every fader straight away because you have one chance and you need to do it now and everything is pre-mapped and everything is ready in the live situation. I want faders. <laughs> Uh, whenever I'm mixing live, I hate mixing on things like iPads or whatever. I, I could do with having, right, guitars too loud, down, vocal needs to come up, up, drums down, up, down, up, because that tactile instant response uh, depends on me having done a lot of the detail work before, and the demands are different. In the studio, I think people just want faders mostly because they've seen big studios with lots of faders. Therefore, you need faders to be successful. And that's just something that our brains do because this person's successful and we're less successful. And we look for patterns. We look and go, what do they have that I don't have? Oh, it must be the faders. Okay, well, it's not the faders. Well, I've got a big expensive console. It must be the console. No, the success of that engineer compared to you or me um, is down to their experience, what they've been taught, what they're listening for, what they've learned, the, the shortcuts they know in their mind to get where they need to go straight away. And yeah, for me, I can very, very, very quickly navigate through reaper and find exactly what it is that i want let's say i want to automate the volume on that i go v for volume make it bigger that section that word that letter up add some points here with the shift and click make it louder that one i need to make quieter i'm done and i'm not guessing if it's too loud i'm not guessing if it's too quiet i can see exactly the number of decibels that i've just done all that by and I can just undo it if it was wrong. And I'm not having to go back. So yeah. But yeah, that that's the thing is that I've worked on consoles. I've worked on moving faders. And for me now, a really nice expensive mixing desk is an overpriced set of preamps. Because what I'll do is I'll patch everything that I need through the desk. Uh, let's say I'm recording a drum kit in a nice studio. 16, 20, 24 tracks of microphones that are all coming in on the desk. Probably won't use much EQ at that point because I'm looking for microphone position and that kind of thing. Then I'll start patching in uh, compressors and that kind of thing as outboard. Then we record and use Pro Tools or whatever it is as a glorified tape machine. And if everything wasn't right, then I should have fixed it somewhere anyway. And I'm not looking at riding any faders or anything like that. And so that's, that's, that, that's how it really should be in most modern tracking situations. And when it comes to mixing, I should be able to send that to anybody and they just bring their faders up virtually or in the real world and shouldn't have to do much. So, yeah. Yeah, so you use a USB controller with faders and pots. I've done that. It slowed me down. I had a big Yamaha mixing desk, which I spent two days programming an OSC to MIDI converter so I could get Reaper to talk to it and do full flying faders. And it slowed me down because I didn't always know what fader meant what. <laughs> and it's it, because I didn't always know which fader, because the the way that you change through banks which fader did what that i just ended up going back to the mouse because it was quicker and it was there and it was in my hand it's like if i see all these faders here if i want to drag the you know the, the bass group up i just got bass up and that went up by 5 db if i want to be more specific there i could just right click on it 
and type in an exact number and it will go there. I can go like minus 15.4 and that's gone minus 15.4. Oh, how about the iPads mixer set up for Reaper? Yeah, at one point I had five iPads laid out on my desk that all had touch faders that had uh, writing on them that told me exactly what each fader was. And I discovered that as much as I wanted to use it, it did not get used. It did not get used. Um, I, There might be the odd little bit here and there, but by the time I'd reached for those faders, I could have just grabbed the mouse and gone click, click, click. Still got the template for the Yamaha. It's it's on an archive drive somewhere. It was a pure data patch. Um, it was a very very specific thing. I don't I don't think it would uh, benefit anybody else because it was a very specific uh, on a per command basis translation. Oh yeah, you can control Reaper with iPads easy uh, in several ways. Um, I have videos about it. Check them out. Um, just search on YouTube for Reaper Remote Control. There's OSC, which is one way of doing it, which is nice and pretty. Or there's there's actually a web interface built into Reaper, uh, which will work on iPads. It'll work on laptops. It'll work on Android. It'll work on anything because it's just a web page. So, yeah. I thought you might ask that, which is why I answered that, is that part of that question. Now, um, I'm just going to hit save yes on this and close this project as well. Uh, it's just taking a second to load up everything because we've been flicking between tabs here. There we go. Close project. And so I will add all the files that we've been working on. And I'm going to take a two minute break here to get myself a fresh cocktail. And I will see you all back here in a couple of minutes. Go and do the bathroom thing, get yourself a drink, whatever it is you want to do. Uh, mouse over trackball, yes, every time. Trackballs give me wrist pain. Hate them. And I can flick a mouse uh, much more accurately than I can flick a trackball. Again, trackballs are another thing like mixing desks where you see them in studios and you think they must be doing better than me because they've got... Uh, because they've got... Uh, come on because they've got a trackball they must be they must know something I don't yeah so yeah uh, that's that's my thought on that as well is that there's a lot in this industry of oh they've got that therefore I've got to get one of them I've had the Kensington trackballs they just give me wrist pain and they're less accurate and if anyone sits down to work at my station uh they instantly are like, uh. So, yeah, no. There you go. Now, going for a break, back in a couple of minutes, get yourselves a drink. Uh, see you soon.
Hello, everybody. We are back. And I now have my replacement drink, my uh, scary thing, chilling down on a, a giant uh, giant ice cube. This is my uh, jelly baby cocktail for anyone who wasn't here earlier. Oh. oh, yes. That one's got less less lime and more Midori and Grand Marnier in it. Because I figured we'd be... Uh, we're not going to be here for that much longer tonight. Because, yeah, I'm not going to spend too much time on the mastering. I know it says it in the title. But I am going to be coming back to this as well at a later date. So there's my Punk Rock in Summer file. And let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. Ah, perfect. A uh, single track. So, there we go. The Green Goblin Gobbler. What? To, to, to cocktail that I've come up with. Actually, no, it's not a cocktail I've come up with. I was shown this cocktail. Uh, but... Yeah, there we go. So you can see this. This is what I would want to see as a mastering engineer. I'd want to see wave files that look fairly consistent, no clips, no massive crush. Um, arguably a little louder than most mastering engineers would like to see, but because there are no clips anywhere, they they can just turn them down uh, if need be, and it's not exactly a particularly difficult task to do that um there we go now so many tools at my disposal what do i start with that's the question Hmm. ah oh, that's getting cold as well because all the ingredients in my little liquor cabinet are all at room temperature and i've started having these giant ass ice cubes you see that's one single ice cube in there that they, they kind of, they cool your drink down without adding too much water to it. Because that's, that's the thing about ice cubes, is that surface area um, determines how quickly they, they melt and become liquid as they go over that enthalpy change. God, I'm really starting to sound like my chemistry teacher again. Fun fact about me, I am such a dyed-in-the-wool nerd. I was part of chemistry club at school. Uh, which um, I'm just going to call this Mishval Mastering. Um, and I almost did a degree at Manchester University in chemistry. <laughs> and at the very last moment, I was informed reliably that you could combine computers, which were one of my favourite things in the world, with music, which is my other favourite thing in the world, and make a job out of it. And I was like, yes, yes, please. So that's why I am in front of you today and not uh, making fizzy banging noises in front of a camera instead, because I'd probably be doing that. I'd probably be some sort of internet scientist at some point because... As you can see, that's uh, that's kind of my thing. But yeah, it, when I tie my hair back and walk down the street with I, I'm literally wearing a Star Trek T-shirt right now. Um, uh, if you didn't think I was a musician, you'd probably think I was a chemistry nerd. Yeah, and chemistry is cool. Uh, but yeah, my great passions in life were always computers and music. And someone told me you could make a living out of that. So I was like, well, sign me up. <laughs> and the uh, journey into being destitute for a decade began. At least if I'd studied chemistry and done well, there's a good chance I might have had gainful employment right from the beginning. <laughs> Marshmallows are a Bunsen burner, yes, quite. Sugar and sulfuric acid, that's always a fun one. Um, so, I have seven songs here, and the first thing that I would do as a mastering engineer is make sure they're all properly trimmed, starts, finishes, so I'm quickly, um, I have assigned a button in Reaper, which is 
um, set selection to items, I've put on shift and Z or Z, and then shift and R makes a region. So I've done that. Actually, no, I'm rushing. That's how I would do things when I need to do things super quick. But what I need to do here is just dive in and make sure that the starts and ends of each file are right. Yeah, starts and ends are one of the more important fundamentals of, of mastery. It sounds obvious and boring, but often at the mix stage, you make sure that there's a leader at the start, a kind of accounting, if there's anything weird going to happen, you've got some silence there. And at the end, again, quite often you'll have like ring outs of symbols and that kind of thing, which means that you'll quite often leave a gap on the mixing file at the end so that the mastering engineer then has like that's too long a gap for a master but it's not too long a gap for a mix in fact it's quite a short gap for a mix there we go because yeah the mastering engineer is not looking at this really as how good can i make this sound a mastering engineer should be looking at this as uh wh when the song starts hits play you can't have the sound really start here because like a lot of audio players uh will take half a second to actually start making sound uh have you ever ever thought about this? Have you ever played a track on a system of some kind where you miss the first half second or like the big impact? What's happening is the digital to audio converters in there, whether it's a computer or a CD player or whatever, um, they're actually missing the first ha like half second because they're trying to engage themselves to start making sound. And so they miss something important. And that's where mastering engineers should know this and make sure that half second gap there is incorporated at the start of a file as just silence so that on 99% of systems, the, the sound gear does start making sound because it's told to start creating silence, which is not nothing. When, when an audio device is told to make silence, it has to be on, which means that the audio device is engaged, which means that the next time the actual sound comes out, it's ready. And these are the silly little things that a mastering engineer has to look for. It's very silly, but... Also, yeah, quite often there'll be drums that, that ring out for ages that kind of thing, which, again, on a mix, isn't necessarily the end of the world. But yeah. See, that's that's too long a gap. But quite often in the digital world, if I hit record, uh, hit render on a mix, uh, something weird can happen where something will reset with a little click. And if that's rooted through a reverb, the reverb reacts to that click and goes... And when it does that, it's a weird anomaly, but as long as there's plenty of gap here for it to have disappeared before the actual audio we want starts, it's not a problem, as long as we took that into account. Let's see, the end of this. There we go. And that looks like that's the end of the song, but no, this is the end of the song because very quietly a reverb tail carries on here and if i was to cut that reverb tail off that would feel terrible that's where that song starts and that's got a nice at the end there as well which i'm fading everything so now uh, i'll just get rid of that and i'll just shift z r z r z r z r and now, oh, I accidentally did something there. No, I didn't. I'm fine. Oh, no, I did. There we go. So that's now seven regions in the mastering project. Hmm. Ah. 
you wanted to get in the yeah if you wanted to get into a studio you better know someone or have some training that's not changed in fact that's more competitive than ever you know how many interns hot pole studios has had i'm not gonna leave you hanging it's zero because i can't take people on because you you would think you can just have a kid turn up at your studio and just push knobs that's not the case these days because you need regular inspections from all sorts of people you need you know there are there are laws surrounding even employing people where you don't pay them now especially in the uk it's uh you can't just do that like you can in america in the us you can take on interns for for peanuts and kind of get away with a lot as a studio even if the intern wants to do it there are there are laws especially in the uk that surround this and make it difficult yeah that is a good looking mix So the next thing that I would tend to do here is I will bring up a second track in my mastering project and the way that I always work, and I know some people don't do this, is I will always, well, I'll mute that track, always have a reference. So I'm going to call this track reference. And before people ask about Oh, well, you've got all, all your songs on one track. Um, if it turns out that there's a particular song that needs something specific and special doing to it, aside from the other tracks, then I will put that on its own separate track and we'll treat it specially. But you hope against all hope as a mastering engineer that, that everything sounds consistent. So I'm just going to quickly turn up my headphone volume a little because I've been running it a little quiet and just flick between these quickly and just see if tonally they match. So apart from there being a slight kind of mid-range 7 to 900 hertz-ish thing in the guitars on Punk Rock in Summer compared to the others, I think we're okay. So what I'm going to do here is, instead of making a whole separate track for it, I'm going to use a clever little shortcut in Reaper that's Shift and E. And Shift and E allows me to add... Oh, perfect. That's the exact one I wanted as well. Um, it allows me to add an effect to an item rather than a track, which is very much usually the video editor's guy, guy's way of doing things. I've been doing this in Premiere for years, although actually now Premiere allows me to do things on audio tracks as well. So actually, when I'm editing videos, I treat that like Reaper, which is a little weird, but it's it's nice to have. And so what I want here is I want to go to mid side mode and I want this to be specifically on the sides and I want to listen for this honk here. So I'm going to bypass this and just flick again. Right, I was about to find the thing here on the sides. But 
but it seems that the guitars on the other tracks are just too good. So what I'm going to have to do is overwrite that file. So I'm going to make a new project tab, go back to Punk Rock Him Summer, which is lucky that I can do this. Uh, in a mastering only context, I would find clever ways to bump up the uh, the guitar level. But seeing as how I also happen to be the mix engineer, I can just kind of cheat and do this. Mm. Yeah, uh, at Banter Media, the company, the media company that I was working with while we built the studio, which is Liam's company, if anybody knows my podcast co-host. Um, we had three interns a year, several years in a row, and the amount of hoops we had to jump through to make it work was crazy. Now, oh, I've still got Soothe going on here. Don't think I'm supposed to have that on there anymore. Where's the bass? What's happened here? When the heck did that happen? Alright, so... There we go. So let's just save that now as uh, mix 14 and go. Mm. Mm. So yeah, I put re-EQ on the first media item uh, because I was thinking that I would uh, use it as a mid-side EQ uh, on the guitars because I could just hear a subtle difference between the guitars. Uh, but on reflection and listening to it, the difference was big enough that it made more sense for me to go back into the mix and change the balance of the guitars because I, I just did quite a big volume bump on the guitars there, even though I took that mid push down on that Neve EQ. And it was, yeah, it's quite a significant change that would be easy, much easier and more productive to do in the EQ than it would to do uh, using uh, a mastering technique. The ideal master is where you do nothing. Never quite the case, but it's the old the old thing that as I get older, I try and stick to more and more and more and more, which is track as if there's no mixing, mix as if there's no mastering. And then master as if you're not doing anything. <laughs> The ideal master is it's it's the the god complex joke, which is if you're doing everything right, nobody knows you're doing anything at all. Ah, that is a tasty cocktail. And with that being my second one of the night, I will definitely sleep. So yeah, the other thing is ha having had two rather strong drinks, I don't want to completely commit to the master this evening. Um so yeah, I will use my better judgment to do things that I would do, but tomorrow I will be checking the master. And yeah, the reason that I'm not currently referencing this against 
published tracks is the the, the copyright gremlins. Um, once I've got everything roughly matched, it is absolutely not Mountain Dew. Um, it is, it looks like Mountain Dew. It is Midori, Grand Marnier and Lime Cordial. It's a cocktail that I call the Green Jelly Baby. Whoa. Grand Marnier is 40% and Midori is 20%. And boy, yes. Tasty. I'll knock your head off. But yeah, I, I am also, uh, for anyone who wasn't aware, a fully licensed uh, barman. I, I have my personal alcohol license. So yes, I um, I know what I'm doing behind a bar. I used to be a bar manager only uh, a year ago. Now I'm a full-time YouTube mix guy, which is very strange, but also quite gratifying. So close that down. And now if I right click on this, it's still closing the old project down uh, and go to item properties and choose new file. I can choose a new file from giving state secrets away. Uh, punk rock him summer. And there we go. Punk rock him summer mix 14 this is how long i've been working on this was the first song we did on this album this was the uh the lead single as it were there we go so this should there we go they don't sound identical but they sound close enough um share the recipe the recipe sure the recipe is a double uh quantro or grand marnier an orange liqueur uh, a double Midori, which is a melon liqueur, and a double of lime cordial. I use Rose's lime cordial, the traditional English drink, but whatever lime cordial you can find, just straight lime. All three, shake over ice, drink. Whenever I would do it publicly, I would uh, pour that over ice in a cocktail shaker and then strain it into a martini glass. But for drinking from home, it's far more practical than a martini glass to just have a large rocks glass and drink it straight over ice. But yeah, if I was getting really fancy, especially when I did it for Halloween, I would have a bag of green jelly babies and I would put a couple of green jelly babies in the bottom of the martini glass. It's just added to it. Because <laughs> then for, for, uh, for Halloween, it's not a green jelly baby, it's a dead green jelly baby because Halloween. Now, um, these guitars don't sound identical to me, but they sound close enough that from a mastering perspective, I'm happy with it. There we go. That's something that I find important in mastering is consistency between tracks. Doesn't matter how good or bad they sound because that's entirely relative. If the artist decides that their album should sound a certain way, <coughs> cool. We're just trying to present the best portrayal of that. But as long as it sounds like every song belongs on that same album, <coughs> excuse me, then that's a good start. Oh, well done, Marty, with that. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't actually recommend Grand Marnier for this because it's got a dark colour and it makes everything look more like Mountain Dew. But, mm, Grandma. <clears throat> well, of course I remember Green Jelly. Uh, fun fact, at one point in Green Jelly, the drummer of Tool, Danny Carey, was a member of Green Jelly. And so was the singer of Tool, me, not James Keenan. Little pig, little pig, let me in. What? So, so let's go with Flatline now from Submission Audio. And I'm going to change the shape on this uh, clipper to be slightly less than a hard clip. And I'm going to take the output of this track down to minus one db exactly because flatline doesn't actually do that for me and that's headroom so that when it's turned to something like mp3 or whatever it doesn't come out as a distorted mess 
Um, when will I reveal the speakers I'm not allowed to talk about yet? When they arrive and when I make the video about them. Uh, it shouldn't be long. But yeah, th there are things that I'm not allowed to talk, talk to, to talk about. Not things I'm not allowed to talk about because of NDAs and products not being launched yet. Um, even though NAM isn't a physical thing this year, it's happening in January, and there are a lot of companies that are going to announce new products in January. And a lot of media figures like me, uh, YouTube can is not the only thing. Things like you know, Premier Guitar Magazine or magazines in general, any sort of press, we get sent either software or hardware to try to give the companies our feedback to tell them what we think, see if there's any last minute changes we think should be made, whether they listen to us or not, it's a different thing. And also we then get to make things like videos and write-ups about these products so that on day one as they launch, we can then go, ha ha, I've been using said thing and it's like this. And yeah, it it helps. It definitely helps. But yeah. Um the uh the short answer to when can X be released is dunno. Uh it varies company to company. And you you might be shocked a lot of the time at just how informal a lot of these NDAs and agreements are, especially the British companies and with, with British media like well, like me. <clears throat> a company will talk to me, they'll be like, here, try this thing. Don't tell anyone, will you? We'll tell you when we can uh, put it out. And you just go, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, no problem. And that's it. You don't sign any forms quite often. You don't do too much, which reminds me there's another company that I need to... Uh, chase about a thing which yeah sorry about being really vague on that one but <laughs> you know um so uh mastering let's have a listen to this this is the same exact 6 db boost that we had before an oversampling i'm gonna crank to maximum which uh makes things like snare hits um <coughs> that little bit cleaner that little bit less distorted because it Oversampling takes this 44 kilohertz mix that we did, because that's the sample rate the band were working at, so that's what I'm working at. It then processes it at four times that, and then converts it back down. <laughs> Nam's come a long way since the 50s, Ace Man, never mind the 90s. Yeah, but yeah, um, this will then uh, bring it back down at 48k, and let's have a listen. Sounds good. Now at this point, this is where I do start to check on different references because this is this is the mastering room and then there's headphones, cars that I can check this on. But all we've done right now is a limiter and I do feel like the low end is a little bit light. Uh, but that could be the monitoring. I'm going to change my monitoring over to the far fields at Archon because they've been redone. For the new uh, VSX 1.1. Marty's having tons of fun over on Twitch with dropping all the uh, the emotes there. Does Flatline deal with ISPs? No, it does not. Um, Flatline behaves exactly like Lavery Gold converters. You know, the, the big expensive converters that everybody had in the 2000s and the 90s. They don't do intersample peaks. They don't do any of that stuff. You get what you get out of them. Uh, which, you know, you just kind of deal with it. So one thing I've done is I've got my output down at minus one here just so that uh, there's m enough headroom that intersample peaks hopefully won't become an issue. But if they do, that's on the converters and that's not really... I don't like saying it, but it's not my issue, you know. Oh, if Ben says, yeah, you don't like Howie's mastering room, have you used it since the update came out this week? There is a new listening position. <clears throat> it came out... It came out a few days ago, and yeah, the original version in there was the 
what they now call the client position. The engineer position sounds infinitely better. Which I don't, I don't know why I'm trying to show you that master in the car. I will be checking in the car, that's for sure. But yeah, one thing that I think I'm going to do at this point is add in the Slate virtual tape machine before Flatline, of course. Everything's going to come in before Flatline at this point. <clears throat> and that is exactly the set of settings that I would use. High headroom tape, uh, half inch two track, 30 inches a second. And let's see how that sounds on uh, this second song, Good Combined because it should just soften the top a little, uh, fatten the bottom up a little, but nothing crazy. Yeah, okay, cool. That's, uh, yeah. So, the virtual tape machine is just adding a certain slight fatness that I, I like. I don't think there are any EQ issues in here, but I'm going to check on the linear mode in a minute to see if there's anything in particular that stands out to me of any weird whistles or anything like that. Um... Because I did hear, actually, um, when I had uh, Brainworks Master Desk, there was a build-up around 3K. So I'm going to, yeah, now open up REQ before Flatline and just add a peak that's very, very precise and just listen for it up near 2, 3K. Uh, yes, I do own the Slate microphones. I've got an ML1 and a pair of ML2s. The ML1's brilliant. The ML2s are cheap but when they work they work beautifully oh sorry everybody that that right there Cool. Um, so that's something I've been l learning to look out for recently is uh, a kind of a low end build up around 160 hertz of a bit of a woof woof woof. That again, I've only taken a few dBs out and 3K, I've taken a couple of dBs out. There's a bit of a whistle up there. Um, I'm listening on the Slate VSX headphones uh, and I'm currently listening on the far fields in the Archon studio. I am going to start switching around when I'm closer there. The, the HD linear sound weird to me. Yeah, sorry everybody. I mean, if your tweeters were going there, that was only 3K. I'm gonna have a quick listen around the top here as well for anything above that. There's a little bit of a ring up there, so I'm just going to take the tiniest bit out there. Oh, yes. Um, thank you, Marty. I have done an entire course on all of this. But yeah, taking out these resonances means I'll probably be able to hit the limiter a bit harder. Oh, I've got to move away from the flat monitoring because the flat monitoring sounds like I'm mixing in a cardboard box. It's awful. 
And yeah, I don't want to use the better maker EQ. I want to use, let's use the Amec EQ. Because that's the one that, um, this is the one that His Royal Highness Mr. Warren Hewitt was absolutely loving. And this has got a little bit of THD in it, a little bit of distortion, but not like bad distortion, like a tiny amount. There we go. Yeah, so I'm adding a significant boost at the very top band, which is 26k. But Adam, you'll say, it's run at 44 kilohertz because the Nyquist frequency, you can't hear that anyway. Yeah, so what's this doing? What people don't tend to understand about EQ, generally speaking, is that uh, when you're given a frequency, that's the center point. Uh, do you need an iLock for the Slate M01 microphone? Yes, you do. Uh, I highly recommend to everyone to get yourself an iLock anyway. Have one. Because they're really good for keeping your licenses on. You can try loads of trials of stuff uh, with iLocks. Uh, if you run across more than one computer, you can take it and move to another computer and just carry on, which I do a lot. I make sure that all the same plugins are installed uh, on this laptop and on my main studio computer so I can just drop a Reaper project in and go. Yeah. Oh, you had an Amec big console. Nice. Mmm. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for the recommendations, everybody. It does mean a lot to me. Yeah. Um, oh, the gain scale in the middle is really useful here. I'm going to try not to... Uh, probably wanted to just add a bit of super low end in here. Uh, how low can this go? 20 hertz. Gee whiz. Uh, let's take the high pass filter up to 30 something hertz and just boost the super lows and see what that does. Hello, David, on Twitch. The Council of Davids have arrived. Yeah, so I'm using this Armour EQ to basically do a bit of a loudness curve to add a little bit of super low end and a little bit of super high end. I want to listen for that little little kind of honk in the middle of Ooh. Oh wow. Yeah, I wouldn't pay 200 quid for this EQ right now. It's good, but I'm paying $15 a month for the entire mixing and mastering bundle from Plugin Alliance, which includes it. I, It's it's a bit of a no-brainer because they have the everything bundle, which is their big thing. That's $25 a month, but it includes all their amps and stuff like that, which I don't use. And for almost half the price, I get all the wonderful shiny toys and I don't pay through the nose. <sighs> Can 
kind of clever, but yeah, uh, mid EQ, that's the one I want. I'll soon cut my hair like There's that honk. Can you all hear the wah 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 wah? So I pushed that up by over 6k. I probably only want to take it down by a couple, if that. In fact, let's make sure I move this EQ to just before the re EQ, it takes the whistle away. Because now I'm probably going to want to add a little bit of aggression up just above that region. I think I think it really won't. What what did I do? Everything seems to have reset. Bizarre. Well, at least I knew where I was. This is mid side. Ah, so if I press the mid side button, uh, it copies it all over to mid and side. That's great. <laughs> How do I unlink these two? <clears throat> That's the next question. Because everything seems to be stereo linked, which is great. <clears throat> Parameter link. There we go. That's better because I wanted that mid duck on the sides a bit, but not in the middle because I didn't want the vocals to disappear. <clears throat> Now, if you phrase it as a suggestion, I don't mind at all. I'm always open to suggestion. So people tell you to do stuff that I get a little bit annoyed, but yeah, by all means.
sorry, what I'm trying to do here is just bring out a little bit of thub, thub, thub in the snare uh, without upsetting the mid balance. So this is a completely different EQ point here. This is 260. Yeah, that snare, if, if this checks out right on the other mixes, I don't know if it's a Tesla, it's an SUV of some kind. Uh, a generic, non-copyrightable SUV. Let's listen to this now on the Farfields and see if that snare sounds too tubby. And it does sound a bit too tubby, so I'm going to back this 3dB off to like one and a half. Right, so this is before, and I'm going to turn, <laughs> turn the plugins on so we get before and after. Flatline I'm leaving on because that's doing the exact same amount of limiting both times. Yeah, a few people have said it looks like the Fab Filter Limiter, but it doesn't sound anything like it, and that's all I care about. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's the thing is like, it's a good layout to show you what a plugin's doing, but if people's hang up is oh it looks like this, it's like yeah, but we don't pay for how it looks. I mean, like the the Slate VSX, if this. If this just looked like 8-bit blocks of, this is this studio, near field, mid field, far field, if it sounded the same, I would not care. Yeah. So I think I'm going to be buying this flatline plugin. It's the only one right here that I'm using that's a demo. I was trying to think what else I would do at this point, because there's the... Yeah... So you can push the limiter harder in the master phase if you do subtractive EQ better in the mixing phase. That sounds fair. Sounds about right. Yeah, that, that sounds... Yeah. I'm not sure if I said that specifically, but that is a very... That's a good point. Yeah, if... Well, the less work you're having to be doing... And yeah, don't worry about subtractive versus additive. It's That's all a load of just hogwash, really. Um, I do additive whenever I feel like. Um, it's just that if there's a problem, subtractive is the obvious answer. Um, try not to have those problems. I mean, that's the first part. But if you do have those problems, just try and remove them as early as you possibly can. Um, just trying to think in terms of compression. <laughs> Yeah, I am going to try adding in uh, the Slate FG Red. And I'm going to add that after the EQs, but before Flatline. And before I even hit play on it, I'm going to set it up in a way that I think I'm going to do. So I'm going to use it in uh, 4 to 1, auto release, slow attack ish. Uh, drive all the way up, high pass filter fairly high up. And uh, so, what I want to do is crush this quite hard. Vielleicht. 
And what I'm going to do is make sure the makeup gain uh, is so that when I flick between 0 and 100 mix, they're roughly the same gain. Because that is obviously way too much mix bus compression. Obviously, that's killing it. Listen. But this is where the art of parallel comes in. I might only end up with a few percent of this in, but it'll just give the mix a bit more excitement. Sounds good to me. And that's that's hitting minus 10 LUFS consistently. In fact, I'm going to change that from integrated to short term just to check it. And the only thing I see really hitting that limiter is the snare. Nothing else. That tells me that as, as far as I can tell, I've done a good job. Because nothing is hitting that, that limiter apart from that snare. Watch. Yeah, looks like a good level. So I'm going to check again in some of these different rooms. That, that snare is still heavy. So what I'm going to do is just push the limiter even further. See if that actually chops the top of the snare off.
Yeah, so the snare's intentionally getting clipped a bit. Uh, because with all the EQ moves that we've made and all oh hello it, er, er, everything that we've done has really kind of worked but almost worked too well that at this point at this point the the kick and the snare I don't know about you but it feels to me like they're coming out a little too much Bring out that bass. Yeah, I think the kick and snare are in front of everything right now. Which is interesting that they were... Sub I'm changing the way that I mix recently because of this change in limiter. Because traditionally, with digital limiters, like the one I know own and FGX, you would have to have your kick and snare significantly louder than everything else because when the limiter came to chop off your transients the snare and kick would be lost otherwise and would then sit back down with the rest of the mix because their heads would be removed. So what I now have to do, and I'm only going to do it with the one song for now, is I'm going to go back into the uh, Punk Rock Him Summer track. And <clears throat> do another render with the kick and the snare down. <coughs> oh! That's how it feels when the kick and snare are too loud. Ah. Oh. Okay, leave file offline. Uh, load up, come on you. <clears throat> but this is the kind of thing that, that happens to me at this phase. Right, so I've taken the snare down by 2 dB and the snare down by 3.5. Let's get that rendered out and see if that does the trick. <clears throat> what else could be wrong in 2020? What, what nobody else has a cough all year. <laughs> <clears throat> yes. I think it happened from inhaling the last of a, a, uh, a green cocktail. Anyway, I think it's getting late here. It's half 11. So what we're going to do now is check that this is the right kind of level now by reducing the kick by 2 dB and the snare by a good 3 dB. I've put definite numbers in here of 2.5 and, and 6. And those should... Uh, those should... Come on, brain, finish the sentence. They should be closer 
in fact, 3 dB, that's a good... That's only at 70% of what it was before. If you know how to convert your dB scales, it's a fun... Uh, it's a fun thing to be able to know is that if you reduce something by three decibels, it's 20 times a logarithm base 10. So what that actually means in real life is if you reduce them by 3 dB, it's at 0 0.707 times what you had before. So it's seven tenths of what you had before. But if you remove something by 6 dB, that's 0 0.5, uh, which means it's literally half as loud. It might not sound half as loud because of the way the human ear works. But mathematically, it is. Uh, if you go down by 20 dB, uh, because I said it was 20 logarithm blah, 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 uh, then it's a tenth of what it was before. So that's something that's good to know with uh, decibels, is that every 20 decibels that you go up or go down, times it by 10. So if something is at 60 dB louder than something else, that means it's a thousand times louder because it's 10 times 10 times 10 times louder. So it's a good way to understand sounds. When someone's got a meter and they go, it's 120 decibels and you're going, oh. and you look at the meter and like you were in a club that had the noise reduction stuff that was only 100 dB and you're like, well, it can't be that different. It's, oh my God, that's 10 times difference. Yeah. So yeah, know your logarithms, kids. Yeah, dB is really confusing when you're new to it, but... They're useful because, like I said, if you've got something that's minus 60 dB, you can probably still hear it. And that's a reasonable number 60 to deal with. Whereas if it was minus 1,000, then minus 10,000 for 80 dB and all that kind of multiplication going down. Yeah, sorry, I'm holding pliers and multipliers. Oh, dear. Because I've been restringing things a lot recently. Uh, but yes. Uh, let's see. Let's just flick back to our tab now. Uh, item properties. Choose new file for Mix 14. And replace it with Mix 15. Where are you? Punk rocking someone. And it was so many flipping mixes. But yeah, there we go. Let's see how this sounds.
you see at the loudest point of that song there now, it was at like minus 10, minus 9 dB, but it was barely shaving off any anything off that snare. That's a good sign of a good rock mix when you're barely touching the damn limiter at the end and it's still just sidechaining the kick to the vocals. Not a chance. Never have done it. Don't like it. Sorry, no. Um, It's not French house. We don't do that. Naughty. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I don't like side chaining things to things at all. And the fact that I've used track spacer at all is very much a new thing for me. <clears throat> but yeah. Yeah, Ariana Grande, song, Grande songs are at minus five. Ariana Grande songs don't have four guitars crashing around in them. <clears throat> she generally has very sparse arrangements going uh, with very pure bass tracks and that kind of thing, which lend themselves to limiting distortion uh, because the extra drive that those levels get kind of sounds pleasing whereas with rock stuff it's already quite a dense mix adding any extra distortion to that tends to take away from it not not add <clears throat> and yeah it's just it's it's a different target but yeah a sign of a good mix is that you are getting to the limiter and the limiter's not doing much Yeah, kick key in the vocals just doesn't happen in rock. Just no way. Um, it, in like R&B, hip-hop, maybe that's a thing. But you want enough space in a mix for both of those to hit at the same time in rock and metal with no ducking at all. Uh, easy mix, best uses. I mean... One of the best mix, one of the best uses for easy mix is uh, getting a refund. No, I'm kidding. Um, easy mix can be good if you are in a rush and you're writing. And you just need. I need a, just a guitar sound now. I need a bass sound now. I need a good drum sound now. Quick, quick, quick. Um, and then think about it later. Yeah, it's great for that. Um, problem with something like easy mix is if you then stick with those sounds. Uh, you sound like every other demo of the last few years. <clears throat> yeah, ducking is something you have to be very, very, very careful with because even the slightest bit too much is noticeable everywhere, even by non-musicians, and it upsets them. It makes them feel seasick. Uh, so, yeah, especially in the genre that I work in, it it doesn't bode well. So, yeah. Um, what I will do then, I will call the stream here. Uh, I will re-render these off off camera with the, the kick and snare level changes and then send them to the band because that's not a particularly interesting thing to show you. That's just half an hour of open, click, click, render, click, click, render. And <coughs> I can be doing other things whilst I do that, like coughing. I'm fine, everybody. Don't 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 worry. It's it's just a little tickle because I've been talking for four hours, no, three and a half hours, and drunk nothing but spirits. So yeah, that's to be expected. Yeah, the loudness was just a neighbor thing these days. We don't need it anymore. But yeah, having the limiter as part of the sound is good. Uh, if if my mixes get turned down a bit with this little limiting. <laughs> Yeah, if Spotify turns that down, that's still going to sound loud, proud, and great. I'm okay with that. Uh, any idea on release a ETA with these? Unfortunately not, because it looks like we're going to be recording and tracking another song or two, uh, which haven't even been sent to me yet. So, yeah, releases on songs take a while. If you remember the song that I did with Aurora Project, Spots to Stripes, that got released this week. And that's months down the line. It just happens because of press cycles and all that kind of stuff. But yes, um, <clears throat> thank you everybody for tuning in. 
And now back to my regularly scheduled programming. I've got, uh, I've not edited any of my own videos in ages because I've been far too busy. Uh, I've got a video to edit for John Brown tomorrow, as well as looking after my daughter all day uh, because their nursery is still closed until next week. Uh, and then we've got the podcast tomorrow night. Then I've got Ivy again on Friday. Then I'm probably going to edit a video Friday night. Then I'm working with John for like nine straight days. Help. <laughs> it's good to be busy. It's good to be very busy and kind of, you know, I think in demand is the word. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's been an enjoyable evening and I will see you all rather soon. Goodbye. Hey everyone, that might be the end of the video, but if you fancy carrying on this conversation, we have a Discord server, link is in the description. We're also on Patreon, which is something you can really help us with. We also are on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at Hot Pole Studios. See you there.